All right, welcome to the Full Art Secrets Podcast. This is the podcast where we will share and discuss strategies to dominate your dental implant market and grow your production beyond your wildest dreams. And as you guys know, we're on a mission to help as many practices grow and to help change as many patients' lives through dental implant treatment. So we'd love your help in getting the word out there. If you're jumping on, please comment, like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff, uh, and help us get out the word so we can help more patients, ultimately. I am Spencer Walker. I'm the CEO of Dental Implant Machine, and this is Robin Dackman, renowned treatment closing master and guide and director of our Full Arch Closing Certification Program. And Robin, we are so grateful to have you on the podcast today. So thanks. Thank you. I'm going to throw our uh, Full Arch Framework for anybody who can see this. There you go. And for anybody who can't see it, let me just remind you. So it's a frame. It looks kind of like a Roman building, kind of like the Pantheon or something like that. And it has three pillars. And the first one is authority architecture. The second is marketing architecture. And the third is closing architecture. And we have been working our way through this. We've covered the authority architecture, the marketing architecture, uh, at least to a certain extent, and the closing architecture. So right now on the closing architecture, there's four parts to this column, the patient, the team, the set, and the console. And that make up this closing architecture. And last time we talked about the patient, this time we are talking about the team. And so I'm going to stop sharing that and let's dive in. And Robin, I'll kick us off about, let me see here, first team member, the appointment setter. And probably let's just do a quick introduction. Who's on the team, right? The appointment setter, the treatment coordinator, and the doctor. These are the three roles that make up the team. And these three roles don't have to, like in some practices, depending on whatever the goal is for the practice, you may have one person who's performing both the appointment setter and the treatment coordinator role. In other instances, you may have multiple appointment setters and even multiple treatment coordinators, depending on how big of a practice you have, right? And so, but what's important is that you have all three of these roles in there. And this first one is the appointment setter is really the forgotten team member, right? We were talking about this earlier. Like, Robin, you've done a lot of consulting. How frequently have you gone into a practice and seen that they are they don't really have an appointment setter or the appointment setter is the person at the front desk who's checking everybody in? You see that a lot when you're out there? I see it a lot. It's probably one of the first conversations we have when we go in and consult is the importance of having someone laser focused in that role. It's in a very important role and it can't be overlooked. So it, it's very common that person is wearing multiple hats mm -hmm. and it's just, it cannot be overlooked. It's one of the most important roles in treatment acceptance. Yeah. The worst is when the office manager is the appointment setter and the treatment coordinator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Recipe yeah. for no growth in your implant production. If you're looking for growth, which this podcast is all about, as we said, dominating your market, then make sure you have an appointment setter. Make sure that appointment setter, it's fine if that person works the front desk too, but give them time away from the front desk in a quiet place where they can jump on the phone. I mean, just think for a second about this, right? You can imagine here's this person working the front desk, phones buzzing, people are walking in and here they are on the phone talking to somebody who potentially, if they were treated right and felt comfortable, could come in and spend thirty to $60,000 in your practice. And imagine your receptionist there saying, oh, just a second, I have a hygiene patient that needs to be checked in, right? Like, let me put you on hold for a few moments. <laughs> like, <laughs> and Robin, you were saying earlier too, you read some study where just trying to shift from doing one thing to another, how difficult that is for human beings. Well, tell us about that. It's very difficult. And I know for me personally, like if I get focused on something, it's hard for me to stop that task and refocus myself on another task. It takes a few minutes to just get back into that mind frame of whatever it is that you're now transitioning to. So if somebody is checking people in and out, and then they need to pick up the phone and schedule a consult, it's really hard to multitask in this position. And, you know, people always want somebody to come work for them that can multitask. But the reality is that naturally people take about 25 minutes and studies have shown this. It takes about 25 minutes to refocus yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's just really not possible to check people in and out, 
also devote the time you need to returning the calls, these leads or incoming calls. One thing that I've suggested is to have times during the day that are those peak callback times. Mm -hmm. So there's times that we know that are the best times that we can call patients back. During those times, have some time set aside for your setter that they can go into a room that's quiet. They can call leads back. I mean, we want people to call back leads as quickly as possible. But if they are in a situation where they're checking people out and they're working the front desk and they're wearing multiple hats, have at least some time set aside to where they can call back leads at those peak opportunities. And depending on the practice, I mean, the lead quantity, it might be maybe 30 minutes to a few hours mm -hmm. or potentially that's their full-time job, right? Really, it's their full-time job. Yeah. Right. So yeah, especially if you're looking to really grow your practice, you definitely need to have that. I've worked with a lot of practices where, you know, having that person, that treatment coordinator appointment setter be the same person works out. But when you try to scale, you have to divide that. You have to. I actually talked to a doctor just this week who was spending sixty thousand dollars on marketing and advertising between everything that they were doing on implant production and not getting that many cases in. And he was trying to like two and a half times the quantity of cases. And for that amount of spend, he could have. But the problem was he had an appointment setter and a treatment coordinator that were the same person. He was limited. That person could only do so many phone calls and only so many consults and follow-ups. They were just limited. And I was like, you know, you're trying to throw money at a problem, but that's not the problem. And that's not the solution to the situation. You need to actually probably spend less and just hire another person and you'll get way more out of that. So great, great stuff here. One thing that we talked about is that this person should be a good listener, be able to ask good questions and able to build rapport quickly. These are tools of persuasion. And, you know, my background would say like, these are really sales skills. These aren't, which, you know, sales is only a dirty word if it's unethical. And what we're trying to do is just be persuasive and help people uh, calm their fears, their concerns, build value. And I mean, obviously, you know, you doctors are investing in your clinical and trying to build up a practice and you have to convince them to go, you know, these people to come in and believe that you're the best solution. And that takes somebody who has certain types of skills to be able to accomplish. So make sure that you have somebody in that spot. I'll tell a quick story. One of our clients a couple of years ago came on board with us and after a couple of months just was not getting going. And they basically just weren't scheduling any consults and lots of leads, but no consults scheduled. So I pulled the doctor aside. I was like, look, and I'm like, this lady that we're training, she may eventually figure this out, but you'll quit us before she figures it out. And she doesn't really have sales DNA. That's what I told him. And I said, do you have anybody else in the practice? And he didn't, but he went and hired somebody else. And based off of that recommendation and within, it was like week and a half, they had their first start. They got a bunch of people scheduled that very first week that this lady started. And their first start occurred like within about a week and a half of her starting. Transformed him, still a client. Like it was all the difference. So anyway, appointment center is your secret weapon. Let's talk about it. the treatment coordinator. Robin, I'm going to kick this one over to you. Tell us about that. So the setter and treatment coordinator, I think are, and I do want to like touch back on the setter for just a second. I always try to get doctors to wrap their mind around the fact that we haven't had these patients that are coming in have probably put this off five, seven, 10 plus years. So the courage that it takes for them to pick up the phone, whoever answers on the other end, like they're in the first minute deciding, can I trust you? Are you the right person to help me? You know, is this someone that can help me fix my problem? And if they're distracted and they're doing multiple things, they're going to in that first minute decide that. So it's so important. And also when we think about the treatment coordinator, I think about them as kind of the practice ambassador. And really the setter and the treatment coordinator kind of carries both of these together, but they are the pipeline of production. And I think that's so overlooked that really the patients that are coming through the door accepting treatment are so dependent on these two roles. And these are the people who are basically the first point of contact for the patient that are coming in. They are, like I said, they're kind of like the practice ambassador. They're who they first meet, they sit down with, 
and again, decide, can I trust you? Is this the right team to help me? Is this the right doctor, the right practice? So as a treatment coordinator, I think there's a lot of functions that you have that are really important. But the two main functions as a treatment coordinator is you always need to either have a patient sitting in front of you that you're presenting treatment to or that you're reaching out to unscheduled patients. So those are the two primary functions I think as a treatment coordinator that you need to be doing constantly. That needs to be your sole focus. And that's why it's so important to be laser focused in these roles. If you're wearing multiple hats, like we talked about before, and you know maybe you're performing another function and then you're also treatment coordinating, a lot of times it's the office manager, maybe the treatment coordinator or the setter and the treatment coordinator, but it takes time to refocus. And as a treatment coordinator, if you don't have a patient in front of you, you need to be always working like your book of business, your pipeline. So the patients that you've seen previously. So that needs to be your sole focus during the day. To me, those are the most two important components of a treatment coordinator. And if you're able to do that, then you can be pushing patients through the same day, accepting treatment the same day they come in, or cultivating all those patients that you've seen in the past. So to me, that's really the primary function of a treatment coordinator is be the ambassador, be a subject matter expert. You know, you need to present yourself as someone who is really just an expert in your field. I think that's so important. They need to look at you as an authority figure. Mm-hmm. And so you need to be working those two things constantly. Excellent. And I would add to this again, I'm going to, you know, say the S word. Salesperson should be a, have a sales background. Probably our top clients are hiring pharmaceutical reps or even car salespeople. It's only unethical if you're pushing something that a treatment that a patient doesn't need. And we are not looking for somebody who's going to be pushy, but somebody who's persuasive, who can allay those fears and help them feel good and comfortable. Just all those wonderful things that you just said, right? So it behooves you to invest in this person and make sure they have the appropriate training and that they have the natural, you know, skill set that sales type DNA, they're geared for it, right? And well trained and ready to go. So all right. Robin, talk to us also about the doctor and their role in the team. I think the doctor is such a key component. You know, working with practices, doctors who really share their vision with the practice, I think they really outperform practices where the doctors don't take that lead. You go into a lot of practices and the doctor's a little more hands-off with the team. Maybe the office manager has that role where they're more hands-on, which the office manager definitely does need to manage the team. They need to be hands-on. But I think that when a doctor has a really clear vision for the team and everybody's moving in the same direction that comes from the doctor, like the doctor wants everybody to be you know, accountable for their KPIs. They want them to work their leads. They want them to work the unscheduled treatment. Everybody's working together. And really a big component, I think, with the doctor is to come together and to openly discuss patients that have come in and have open discussion and feedback on what's working, what's not working. And everybody, and it comes from the doctor, will communicate together of how to best move that patient forward. So I think that the vision that comes from the doctor, that really starts with the morning huddle, right? So you know, the doctor can come in, start the day off with the morning huddle. Everybody comes accountable for their individual responsibilities to contribute to production. The setter comes in prepared for that. The treatment coordinator comes in prepared for that. But the doctor leads that vision every morning and it sets the team on a path to where everybody's working towards a common goal and their why. What the doctor doesn't really share that vision with the team of what their goals are, where they need to be every day, you know, I think it really, it's a game changer. If I don't see that from the doctor coming in, they really don't perform as well as practices that have the doctor really taking that leadership, that visionary role with the practice. The vision comes from the top in every single business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's forgotten in the industry. And so when the vision comes with the doctor, the team will rally around a leader Mm -hmm. and they need that leader. And a doctor is that leader. It's not the office manager. It's not everybody else. The doctor is that leader. And so you have to have that authority figure. And I think that once the doctor sets the vision for the team, that the team will fall in line. Without vision, the team is everywhere. There's, you know, it's chaos. You know, everybody's kind of doing their own things, their own silos. But if the vision comes from the top, then I think the team can rally around the doctor's vision and you're going to have that outperforming team than the practices that don't have that. 
Yeah. What's the saying without vision, the people perish? Right. Exactly. And that's true of the team members there in the office, those employees, as well as the patient. The doctor shows up and is like, oh, I don't know. This seems like a tough case. I think I can handle it. Or gets in and is like, you know, whatever, instead of just a boldly assertively like, hey, I'm the doctor and here's what I'm prescribing. <laughs> here's what you need. That can be all the difference in that confidence. So yeah, great points. Great points. And you brought up the team huddle. I'm glad you did. It's kind of the final thing that we were going to discuss today. That team huddle in the morning doesn't have to be long. And, you know, it can be integrated in with, if you already do, it's the best practice out there to have a team huddle, make sure everybody's on track. You can integrate it into that. You can also have a little separate one, maybe have your normal team huddle and then do a quick little implant huddle, right? Mm -hmm. For the day with your implant team here. But it's really an accountability huddle. And early on, we called it the accountability huddle, but it's really that opportunity for the doctor to say, I'm carving out this time because this is so important to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm spending it with you and I'm going to make sure we're all aligned and everybody's you know, doing what they're supposed to. And then to ask what we call the critical question. So on this huddle, obviously all the team members would be there. Ideally, the doctor is leading it. It doesn't mean the doctor has to do all the prep for it or whatever. Make the assignments. Okay, you bring your numbers, you bring your numbers, you know, you report on this, you report on that, right? And then the doctor gets in and says, Okay, talk to me. What happened here? What's going on with that? You know, and ask the questions and now people feel accountable, especially in a practice where the doctor, it works in every practice. I don't care if you're in a DSO or whatever, but especially when the doctor is the one who cuts the paycheck and is like, I've asked you to do X. This is your job. Did you do it? And how well are you doing it? Right. All of a sudden that person feels much more accountable to actually fulfilling on that and getting their job done. So some of the critical questions that you would want to ask in this, oh, let me just say one other quick thing before we get into the critical questions is if you have any sort of dashboard where you have leads coming in or some sort of pipeline, if you're using some sort of software, CRM or whatever to manage that inside dental implant machine, we have one, we call it the command center. I highly encourage you to open that up, have your team members open that up. So, you know, best practice would be they're actually recording their numbers in some sort of spreadsheet, you know, somewhere so that you can see them over time, what's going on, but keeping track of that so you can see trends, et cetera. But it also is important to not just have that reporting tool, but to also visually see if leads are being moved through the pipeline mm -hmm. and, you know, from stage to stage. I have been in many calls with clients where the appointment setter is like, or the treatment coordinator is like, I called everybody I have, you know, nobody's responding. And then we pull up the command center and lo and behold, there's, you know, 30 or 50 new leads that have never been contacted. They literally have not been logging in and doing their daily actions. They've been telling the doctor they were doing it. In some cases, they were even having a daily huddle and they were saying they were doing it, but they actually hadn't. They were busy. They had a lot going on. Doctor visually didn't confirm. So open it up. It just adds that extra element of making sure that somebody's doing what they're supposed to, saying what they're doing, or doing what they're saying, and then ask some of these questions. These are some of the critical questions. How many appointments did we schedule yesterday? How many appointments were on the schedule for yesterday and how many showed? How many are on the schedule for today and are we prepared for today's consultations? We can coordinate that. Who's coming in? What's their name? Do we have everything you know? How many treatment starts came from yesterday? How many patients have you presented treatment to that are now, you know, your unscheduled treatment? How many are on the unscheduled treatment list? And is anybody getting close to starting? What's the status of that? These are just some simple questions. There are others you could get into talking about, you know, is the lab, is this ready for that person? Is this, you know, it's a time you could coordinate with that. There's others in our full arch closing certification program. We teach this and we have few other questions and some more to it. It's a little bit more robust than this, but at a minimum, do this and it's going to be life-changing, especially again, if you're the doctor and you're asking these questions. Robin, am I missing anything here on the team huddle that you would want to contribute? There's a couple of things that I think are really important for the morning huddle. So as a treatment coordinator, and I'm, I'm speaking from experience of a treatment coordinator doing you know, a lot of production, as a treatment coordinator, I think every day you need to bring five hot leads to your morning huddle. And these are like the five hottest leads you have. Of course, we have unscheduled treatment, like, you know, we can call like a work. 
But these are like the five patients that are on the tipping point that we want to get in the door. And we always want to bring those to the huddle. So I always encourage everybody, have five hot leads ready. Why do we want to bring them to the morning huddle? I think there's a lot of opportunity to have some open discussion. These are by five hot leads. Some could be from the previous day or the day before. They're going to be always switching out because hopefully we've either crossed them off our list and they move forward treatment or maybe something happened that some didn't move forward. But when we come together as a team and we look at those five hot leads, there could be something within that team that I don't see as a treatment coordinator that could help push that patient forward. So for example, the doctor could say, you know what, I remember that patient had a really maybe severe infection. Maybe there were some medical concerns. I think that I could take the lead on this and call the patient back and readdress. And I know that we don't have the doctor calling all the patients back, but there could be, the doctor could say, you know what, I had really good rapport with that patient. And I am really concerned about that infection they had or the low bone or something like that. I am going to help. Let's coordinate together to figure out how can we get that patient back in by really building urgency with that one specific situation. So we can, as a team, take a look to say, okay, what are some tipping points that we have for these five hot leads? How can we come together? Maybe somebody in that group knows something or has a you know, connection to that patient and we work together to get that patient back through the door. So those five hot leads, I think, are very critical. And I think that we should always have those front and center and we should be working those very aggressively every day. And as a team, we're all working together as a team to get those five hot leads to the door. The other thing, and this is a tricky one, and you have to be careful as a treatment coordinator. I know that doctors, you know, they are an authority figure and sometimes feedback and, you know, especially from a treatment coordinator, feedback from a doctor treatment coordinator. I'm saying this knowing some doctors are listening in, but I can sit there and when the doctor is giving the prescribed treatment plan, I can see visually that maybe if they blew up the CT scan and maybe honed in on an urgency a little bit more, I can sit back and see that maybe there were some missed opportunities the doctor could have built urgency, either health urgency, time urgency, maybe some financial urgency. There's maybe some different things that we could work together in the future. So it's a good time to, I think, share feedback with the team of maybe some missed opportunities. And also that kind of ties into our hot leads, like how can we go back and readdress those? Mm-hmm. That's a really good time to share feedback with the team of how can we work together to, I, as a treatment coordinator, I'm going to provide you all the information that I just gathered on the patient. I'm going to try to guide you to help build urgency when you go in and prescribe treatment. And the doctors are pulling, being pulled in all different directions. So sometimes it's hard for them to go in and remember all those things when they're prescribing the treatment. I think when we kind of get into that rhythm to where we're providing feedback after the prescribed treatment plan has been delivered, that's a really good time for us to have open communication about those things during the huddle. And like you said, this not might not be a time for the whole huddle with the clinical team. This could be a time for like that implant huddle. Mm-hmm. But I think open feedback is really important. And on the flip side, it could be the doctor expresses with the team, you didn't give me a good urgency yesterday. You did not provide me a good vision. You didn't give me good pain points. I need you guys to dig deeper with your patients. So it goes both ways. I think it's a really good time for doctors to keep the team accountable for their emotional anchors that they should be providing to the doctor and also to work both ways and how do we help the doctor create urgency with the patient. We need to be able to provide feedback in a way that, you know, is in the best interest of the patient and patient-centered care. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, today we've captured or talked about the team, who's on the team, overview of what their role is, how to keep the team accountable and organized and cohesive and working together. And next time we're going to talk about the set and then we'll get into the consult. So we're going to talk about script, like how to, you know, engage somebody, how to get more people actually, more of those leads actually turning into consults. And here's a little secret. The setter is responsible for the show rate. Like what they say on the phone will dictate whether that person, whether more people show up for their appointments or not. So we're going to talk some about that and get into some of these nitty gritty things that you guys can do that will just skyrocket your close rate. So very excited about that, Robin. Thank you so much for jumping on with us today. And until next time, thanks everybody.